Okay, well, I'll continue with the presentation, especially for those that are uh, joining online to keep time moving for this. So where we left off, we were um, just looking at the DDoS trends, looking at the increase of bandwidth over the years. Now we're going to go through and just do some graphical representations of what a different type of DOS attack looks like. So a plain denial of service attack where they're um, only having one attacker to one victim, um, the attacker sends either valid or invalid traffic to the victim to overwhelm their resources. As I mentioned before, if the attacker has more resources than the victim, you don't need fancy botnets. Now, if we look at a plain DDoS attack, the main difference here is the introduction of a botnet or a network of infected uh, malware virus infected computers that are under the control of the attacker. The attacker sends a message to the botnet directing them to take action on their behalf. And then the bots all send the traffic to the victim and the traffic can be valid traffic like HTTP requests, or it can be invalid traffic of just flooding the connection with lots of bandwidth attack. So all of these bots send their traffic to the victim, overwhelming the victim. Now, graphically, I only show the five computers in the botnet, but some large botnets, well, the largest that, that I've seen personally was in a few hundred thousand computers. So maybe 400 or 500,000 computers all acting as one network of bots. Now that's very large, that was many years ago, and it's actually very difficult from an attacker's point of view to create and manage such a large botnet network. So a lot of them that we're seeing now are much smaller, tens of thousands of computers acting as one botnet. So now if we take the botnet style of an attack, we can add in reflection and amplification. <clears throat> and this is how some of the largest attacks of terabits per second are being done. So the same thing as before, the attacker has a botnet and they instruct the botnet to perform an attack. <coughs> the main difference here is the use of a server in the middle that usually is not configured properly or has a vulnerability in it. They also are servers that use the UDP protocol because UDP is connectionless. There's no TCP three-way handshake required. So the bots in this case are sending a DNS query to DNS servers, but they are spoofing their from address. The from address is going to be the victim. They're also sending a request for a TXT record that is very large in size. So the TXT record is actually under control of the attacker to make it as large as possible. So the open recursive DNS servers talk to the authoritative name server. This is the one controlled by the attacker. The authoritative name server replies with a very large TXT record. This is then cached or cached by the open recursive servers. They now think that they are replying to the source of the request, but this is actually the forged or faked IP address that is really the victim. So now you have the bots sending a lot of requests. The DNS servers are sending these much larger replies and directing them down to the victim. Now, this is especially good from the attacker's point of view because most DNS servers are run by professional corporations on large networks with a lot of bandwidth. So the bot computers could be home computers on home internet connections, 
but usually these DNS servers are much larger networked machines. So here you can have a very small request end up with a 4,000 byte response. That's what we call the amplification factor. So for reflection, you need to have a UDP protocol application. Spoofable, you can fake the IP address and they're connectionless. For amplification, you want protocols and services that allow for a small request to end with a large reply. So this is a little chart of a few different protocols in what their amplification factors are, depending upon the size of request versus the size of reply. You can see that most of them are quite small. NetBIOS, SNMP, small requests end up with large, you know, medium large replies. Bottom left, we have DNS. DNS allows for a much larger amplification. LDAP as well allows for much larger amplification, but there's not too many public LDAP servers. NTP down in the bottom right. If an NTP server is running an older version with a vulnerability in it, this can end up with over 500 times amplification. So one megabit per second of requests ends up as 500 megabits per second of replies coming out. This is for every server that's being used. Now we add in memcached. Memcached had a vulnerability. Memcached was a commonly poorly uh, installed and configured publicly accessible service. And this actually allowed the attacker to upload a file into memcached and then request it again and again and again using the UDP protocol. So a very small request would result in a whole file being sent out as the reply, spoofing and forging the source IP address and sending it to the victim, up to 51,000 times amplification. So this is an example. You may notice the screenshot from uh, Wireshark here. Now, I'm using DNS as an example, and I'm also not doing anything special. I'm not creating a special TXT record that's 4,000 bytes long. I'm simply using existing TXT records on a publicly accessible domain name. So here you can see that I'm doing a request. I'm doing a request using dig for any response. So of course, I'm getting the SOA, the MX, the NS, and a whole bunch of TXT records. By doing a small request for Microsoft.com, I end up with 539 bytes of response. So 73 bytes for the request, 539 for the response. So mitigation strategies. So to help mitigate against connection exhaustion, not the bandwidth side of things, you of course can go through and tune your TCP IP stacks for individual servers, operating systems, and systems in the middle. Here you can do uh, TCP um, reuse. You can do uh, decreasing the wait delays to close connections faster and enabling SIN cookies in case um, a SIN attack is something that uh, attackers are going to be seeing as a useful thing against your system. You can also configure your service applications, not just at the operating system layer. layer. For example, Slow Loris was attacking um, event-based MPMs in Apache. It would grab and hold on to a connection and the way the Apache MPM module would work it would just allow it to be held onto for a long period of time. 
This of course has been modified and there's different modules that you can use in Apache. But an example of an alternative is using Nginx. Nginx is something that actually used a different type of uh, processing module and was more resilient against slow loris. Even if you couldn't change your Apache server, you could always put Nginx in front of Apache acting as a reverse proxy to protect your Apache web server behind it. You can also implement some of the fancier intrusion prevention systems or DDoS filtering. Some of that's included in some of the advanced firewalls, the, the next gen firewalls as they call them. Even if your firewall doesn't provide DDoS protection specifically, sometimes the intrusion prevention system or IPS services will block some types of DDoS attacks. So blocking some attacks is better than none at all. You can implement load balancing with additional servers. Sometimes the effects of a DDoS attack are felt even more when it's the matter of under supplied resources. If you're running too small of a web server, too small of memory and CPU resources, it can look like a DDoS attack as well. And of course, if you're talking about connection exhaustion for a web server, you can put a web application firewall in front of it, which can look for a lot of malicious traffic at the web application layer and do some rate limiting or blocking of that traffic there as well. You can also install dedicated on-premise DDoS filtering appliances. Some of the benefits for this is low latency because they're physically close to your network and service and a high degree of control because you're managing the machine and the service itself. Downsides, of course, the cost can be higher, ends up as a, a capital expenditure because you're having to buy this large physical box that you put on your network. There will be bandwidth limitations because you're putting it on your network so it's not increasing the bandwidth of your network and it's not blocking traffic before it reaches your network. And of course, DDoS filtering appliances do require technical expertise to configure and operate properly. So looking how an on-premise DDoS filtering appliance would look like, here we have a very simple network layout. You have the cloud, you have a couple of routers at your edge, a couple of internal routers, and the target service that's being attacked. Any of the red lines indicates where the attack traffic is going. So by putting in a DDoS filtering appliance on your network, the traffic still comes from your diverse uplink paths. It still goes through to your internal router, but what you are preventing is the traffic from reaching the target. If this is connection-based attack, this will keep your service up and running. If this was bandwidth exhaustion attack, it's not going to be as useful. So looking at bandwidth exhaustion attacks, you can do proactive rate limiting, especially if you're looking at different types of attacks that may be targeted at you, such as fragmentation attacks, as well as abusing unwanted port activity, making sure that those are blocked and rate limited. You can also do reactive rate limiting. After you detect the DDoS attack is in place and happening against your network, you can actually rate limit some of your less critical network locations. So for example, if you're running a service that is primarily accepting traffic locally within Thailand or within your own country or economy, you may be able to rate limit the connections coming from other countries. So rate limit your international connections coming in, which are less critical than your domestic hosted customers. One example that you can use here is remote triggered black holing, RTBH pretty straightforward and, uh, and fairly common in uh, DDoS mitigation. So if we take our 
general network diagram here where you have traffic coming from the internet and attacking your target on premise. You can have an additional router off to the side, and this can be your trigger router. This allows you to send messages from there that update the routing messages on your edge. And this basically says wherever the attack traffic is coming from or even destined to just the one target, you can send that off into a bit bucket and make sure that it doesn't continue further into your network. Now, the benefit here is that you do stop the traffic from taking over your internal network and you know, possibly affecting many other services. The downside here though, is the target is going to be unavailable because you're black holing traffic destined to that target. So you remove the actual destination of the attack to help benefit all the other services that are running on your network. So it's a partial solution. Now, if you take the same remote triggered black hole activity, but you do the triggering to your internet provider, to your upstream connections, then the traffic doesn't actually come down to your network at all. Your target is still offline, but you are saving the bandwidth to your external edge routers. This can make your entire network still more accessible. So here, when the traffic is coming from botnets and many servers from different internet providers, it will reach your upstream connection and that's where the traffic will get dropped before it comes down to your network. An improvement across this is actually, instead of having your servers self-hosted, hosting them in multiple locations using Anycast. Now, Anycast specifically here, because then the local traffic, attack traffic will be kept local to the destination of the physical server closest uh, routing and geographically to where it is. So here you can see the, uh, the internet provider on the left and the right, both hosting one of your target services and the botnets that connect locally to those internet providers will not transit across through ISPA. The attack traffic, because it's any cast, will go to the closest server. Now, a modification for that is instead of hosting your service around, you can virtually host it through a DDoS cloud scrubbing filtering service. All of the big providers will be um, doing this sort of a thing. We saw presentations earlier about Cloudflare providing this type of a service, but there are many uh, companies that do this as well. Here, instead of hosting your service in multiple locations using Anycast, here you have Anycast being advertised, but the traffic is being tunneled back to where your server lives. In this example, it's living on premise. The green dotted line is usually a GRE tunnel or something similar. If you only allow that traffic from the cloud DDoS scrubbing centers, then the attack traffic will go to the closest location. They will clean the traffic and only the legitimate requests will be tunneled back to your authoritative server. Now, we can't forget that DDoS attacks start from somewhere. So we've been looking at DDoS attacks coming into your network, attacking you. But what about computers on your network acting as part of a DDoS attack going outbound to someone else. Here, you want to be looking at rate limiting your outbound connections. If you are seeing high bandwidth, high connection account or connection count attacks going out, especially on certain ports and services, that could be a sign that your 
network is being used to execute a DDoS attack. You can also do outbound filtering on source address validation. This is part of best common practices uh, 38. This is part of manners, which is used uh, for the anti-spoofing and filtering aspects for it. This is basically saying that if your network has source IP addresses going out that don't belong to your network, don't allow them out. Don't allow computers on your network to spoof the source IP address. That is a, a very easy sign of malicious activity. You can also make sure that you are not being used for reflection and amplification attacks. If you're running any service publicly that uses UDP, you have to make sure that it is up to date, that it does not have any vulnerabilities. And if it doesn't have to be public, it should be protected and firewalled. DNS servers, NTP, if you have SNMP open on any service, and definitely if you have memcached. And when it comes to it, making sure that you don't have open resolvers, open recursive resolvers. If you're running a DNS server, it can and will be used for malicious activity unless you have it protected. The easiest way is to only allow your network to use your DNS server. Is there a reason why a network on the other side of the world is using your recursive DNS resolver. I'm not talking authoritative DNS, but your recursive resolver. They should only be used by your local network unless you're purposefully running a public server such as quad nine, 8.8.8.8. But they have protection around their networks to make sure that they are not being abused for reflection and amplification attacks. So that was the, the presentation on DDoS attacks and looking at an overview of that. Is there any questions around DDoS attacks at all? Cool. So I'll move into the next presentation. So this one here is looking at things a little bit differently. This is looking at reporting on vulnerabilities. For example, if you were running a DNS server that had vulnerabilities, if you were running an NTP server that was not configured properly and could be used for DDoS attacks, wouldn't you like to know about that? If someone found a vulnerability on your network, how would they tell you about it? Do you have a good channel for people to send in reports of vulnerabilities on your network. A couple of years ago, APNIC went through this set of discussions and actually created a vulnerability reporting program. And this is just an overview of the program and the results after one year of operation. So just an overview, if you don't know APNIC's um, operation and business, we're the regional internet registry for Asia Pacific region, which takes up 56 economies. Our main operation is distributing and managing IP addresses. We are a not-for-profit organization. We are purposefully open and transparent in everything that we do. We have approximately 120 staff in Australia. We have multiple data centers in Australia and internationally. We use IAAS hosting on AWS and GCP, a little bit on Azure. And we've got multiple SaaS applications and vendors as most companies would. What is a bit different to other companies is not just with websites that we're hosting, um, not just traditional VPN, uh, SMTP and DNS servers, but we also run some slightly obscure servers. Um, we still run a public FTP server because there's some parts of infrastructure on the internet that still uses FTP. 
we run who is servers, which is usually in the realm of just registries. We run RPKI, and as part of that, we even run public rsync servers. There are not many companies that legitimately are running public FTP and rsync servers anymore. APNIC has an internal IT team. We actually have two internal IT teams, but they work very closely together. We do internal vulnerability scanning, and we've contracted companies in the past to do external penetration testing against our networks. We have developers that are writing new applications and creating new things that are published to the internet. And the APNIC Computer Security Incident Response Team, or CSERT, was created internally to formalize our incident response procedures and overall perform the coordinated information security work. Now, before we had the vulnerability reporting program, we actually didn't have a proper public way for people to report security issues to us. So some security researchers would email our privacy email address. Sometimes they would even email human resources with information about vulnerability reports. Now, there was a couple real ones, legitimate reports that came through, but we did occasionally get scam emails that sort of look like a vulnerability report, but in reality, it's just a scam. You know, an example, of a scam message is one here, and it sounds real. They say, uh, I'm a web security researcher and found vulnerabilities and bugs in any website. I visited your website, checked the privacy, and there's a big error in the login for your site. So it's not using perfect English, and it's being very vague in what they found. If you pay me a reward, I will then send you an email with the details. So it's basically a scam. It's basically doing security extortion at this point in time. If you take some of the words here and do a Google search, you'll see this message um, reported many times being used as a scam. So we had some discussions internally, and it basically went along the lines of, well, we should have a point of contact for security researchers to send us email about vulnerabilities they find. So that, that's reasonable. But if we create an email address or a way for them to communicate with us, we'd need to advertise it. We'd need to tell people about this address or web form or whatever it is that we use. But if we advertise the address, it could be abused. People could send emails to that address for different purposes, and that would overwhelm our security team. So we need to set some rules around what this email address is to be used for. Now, this sounds a lot like a bug bounty program where people are paid money for any bugs or vulnerabilities that they find. But APNIC isn't a really big corporation with lots of money, so we can't pay out bounties. So the question then was, would a bug bounty program work without the bounties? Could we do that, publicly say, we can't pay you money, but if you find a vulnerability, tell us here. So thus was born the APNIC Vulnerability Reporting Program, sometimes called a Vulnerability Disclosure Program, or VRP or VDP. We went through, we read a lot of texts about other vulnerability programs and bug bounty programs. We were learning from how other people had grown and changed and developed their programs. We passed it around internally, got feedback, did improvements. We used a very early template from a website called disclose.io, and this was for safe harbor wording. Safe harbor is basically saying, if you report a security vulnerability to us, we promise to not sue you. And this is actually a, a legitimate fear for security researchers. There have been many cases 
where a security researcher has found a vulnerability and when they try and report it to a company, they are sent legal matters, lawyers sent to them and they are being sued and put in jail. Now, Disclose.io, since we used it, has actually grown and has a lot more useful information on their website. They actually have entire vulnerability program generators and templates. So if you're thinking about doing this as well, Disclose.io is a great resource to use. Now, after we were creating all of this, we thought we should probably get the legal team involved. So we passed all the information by them. They made some changes and made sure that everything is going to be legal for the legal environment that APNIC operates in. So on the right hand side is, you know, zoomed out so you can see it top to bottom. Uh, this was the first of our public vulnerability reporting program. So the sections that we went through, we started off with a background to explain who APNIC is to a security researcher. We gave an introduction of our vulnerability reporting program, calling it bug reporting. We talked about what was in scope, which is actually star.apnic.net. We wanted to know about every system that might have vulnerabilities. We talked about what's out of scope. For example, we didn't want phishing emails or social engineering emails or phone calls sent in. We also didn't want people trying to do DDoS attacks against us and saying, hi, you're vulnerable to DDoS attacks. We didn't want any of that sort of a thing. So we put that as out of scope. We told them how we want a report to be sent and the safe harbor wording. So some of the wording on the, uh, the bug reporting, you know, we value the hard work. Um, please use this email address. And we set the expectation of we will reply within seven days. So people know how quickly we're going to be operating. As I said, the scope was start off, which is wonderful. Out of scope, no destruction of data, no social engineering. We also didn't want people to physically turn up to our office and put a brick through our windows. Um, so we said no physical security controls are to be attacked either. We also said no third party sites. You know, we use Let's Encrypt and Okta and Cloudflare and Zoom. Um, we don't give you permission to try and break into their services. We also published a GPG key if anyone wanted to submit encrypted messages to us. And we created a security.txt file to put on our website so that if uh, security researchers wanted to look in one common place to see if we had a program and what email address, this is an example of what our security TXT file actually is. So who's on the receiving end of reports when they come in? We basically said the IT teams will be good. They have um, existing ticketing systems in place, rotations and everything. We had an email address, ccert at apnic.net. It was only being used internally, so we actually repurposed it and used it for this purpose as well. The IT teams will handle the upgrades of third-party software. Uh, but what about all the code that was being written internally? So we said, oh, we should probably talk to our developers internally and make sure that they're part of this discussion. So uh, we didn't forget about them, honest. So we started having discussions with the developers. And up until this point in time, we actually didn't have a formal vulnerability fix program in place for our developers and the code that they were writing. So we needed to inject some security procedures into that coding development cycle. We also needed to put in some timeframes for how quickly that they would confirm a vulnerability, fix a vulnerability, test a vulnerability, and how quickly something could get pushed into production. Now, just five days before we were going to publish the vulnerability program on the website, we actually got a, a report to the email address. I think it might have you know, been public somewhere and 
we don't we weren't really talking about it but we hadn't launched the program properly yet but it existed and someone reported a legitimate vulnerability to us it was a cross-site scripting vulnerability um, which was great and um, it was a very early test of our procedures um, so quickly we said oh we need to add a thank you section onto our website so we created a thank you section at the bottom of our vulnerability page and thanks to Denny, who is our first official uh, vulnerability security researcher under this program. So we finally created our blog post, put it out publicly. This blog post was put on our own website and no other advertising was done for this program. We were a little bit cautious because we didn't know how quickly and how many reports we would get and we didn't want to be overwhelmed at the beginning. So we put a message on our own blog and that was about it. So in the first few months, we got one report per month. This was great. It was nice and slow. It allowed us to go through, test our procedures, test working with our internal teams to make sure that things got handled properly. <clears throat> got us to document standard operating procedures, document replies so that we could just copy and paste messages back to security researchers, and everything was going good. Then about three or four months into the program, it started going up. People started paying attention that we had a vulnerability reporting program. And uh, in December, we actually got 13 legitimate reports in that one month. Now these reports in this line, these are validated, deduplicated reports. So if multiple people sent in the same thing, we only counted that as one and only for the first person who submitted it. Now, if we track that and do a cumulative count, which is the orange line here, we can see that um, over just over a year, one year and a few months, we ended up with 81 unique validated vulnerability reports. So I, I think that was a, an awesome um, response to this program so far. But one report is not the same as another. So we're breaking it down by severity here as well. P1 being the highest severity, P5 being the lowest severity. And you can see a nice little trend here that we received a small number of critical P1 reports and a large number of very low severity reports, which is how you'd expect to see it. The types of reports, we got 16 reports of information disclosure. Now this is just regular information disclosure this could be like some log files that are being exposed on a website, um, things that didn't have sensitive information in them. We had 10 reports of reflected cross-site scripting, five reports of stored cross-site scripting, five denial of service attacks where they found something that could do denial of service, but they didn't actually execute the denial of service, so that was nice, um, and four clickjacking attacks. Now for those P1s, we actually had three priority one reports. These were around SQL injection and sensitive information disclosure. So these are, are pretty high level vulnerabilities, which we probably wouldn't have found if it wasn't for this program. Now that P1 incident of um, sensitive information disclosure we actually did the right thing. And as part of the process of going through and fixing it up, we actually went public, letting people know that we actually had a potential data breach situation here. So as you can see, APNIC left a dump of its Whois database on a public cloud bucket. It's your typical S3 bucket vulnerability of poor permissions here. Now, luckily, most of who is is public information already. So it was only a small bit of sensitive information, and it was mostly relating to companies 
rather than individual people. So luckily, the, uh, the impact was limited here. Just to go through and list out all of the different types of vulnerabilities that we got here, the ones on the left we already talked about, um, the five each of denial service and stored cross-site scripting, these we classed as like a medium severity. Um, same on the right-hand side, the host header poisoning. Um, this actually allowed people to bypass authentication for one system. So we class that as a, a medium severity as well. Um, and the, uh, the, the high severity ones at the bottom, you can see in red, the sensitive information disclosure and the SQL injection, along with a whole range of other sorts of vulnerabilities. Now, this was actually really useful for all of our teams at APNIC because by finding and knowing about a vulnerability in one system, we're able to look for the same type of vulnerability across the rest of our systems as well. As well. So on the right-hand side, you saw one each of many things. If we didn't work on across all of our systems, they probably would be multiples of those vulnerabilities. So having a look at who was reporting these vulnerabilities, we had 45 security researchers that only sent in one single report each. They came, they found something, they reported, and they moved on. We had nine security researchers that sent in two reports each that were unique and validated. Three researchers sent in three each, and one researcher sent in four, and one researcher actually did a really good job and sent in five reports to us, which was really excellent. Most of the multiple reports came in on the same day. They were either looking at multiple vulnerabilities on a single system, or they looked for the same vulnerability across many different systems and doing those as individual reports. We also received 33 duplicate reports, and these are not included in the other numbers and statistics. Uh, we replied to the security researcher saying, sorry, someone else has sent in this exact information. So lessons that we learned from running this program. A vulnerability reporting program is extremely useful to complement other existing tools and practices that you're doing. You could be doing a lot of security, but if you're not letting other people report vulnerabilities to you, you are missing out on some very useful information. Good communication with your internal stakeholders is important, especially before, during, and after launch of a vulnerability reporting program. Having standard operating procedures and response templates makes it easier and more consistent to handle these reports. And of course, the biggest learning here is that bounties, paid bounties are not required to launch a vulnerability reporting program. Some of the worst thing that could happen is nobody sends in a vulnerability report. But if you're not spending money in the first place to run up one of these programs, it's not a very bad, um, you know, uh, response and balance to things. The other thing that we learned is managing the management reporting, sorry, reporting to our management internally gets harder the more vulnerability reports come in. If you're only getting one a month, it makes it very easy to communicate to your senior management. But when you start getting 13 reports and the timelines are overlapping, it makes it a lot trickier to do that reporting back to your management. So what's happened since that first year of operation? Around the one year mark, we started realizing, hey, this is going really good. We're getting some very good benefit from this. We started looking at vulnerability handling companies to do different coordination we selected HackerOne out of a few different vendors, and we're using HackerOne to receive, validate, triage all of the reports and deduplicate them as they come in. 
Then after they go through all that process, the information is passed over to our IT team to route internally to the right people and get the work done. They also provide the reporting service. So remember I talked about reporting to internal management. They provide nice little charts and graphs and they track all of this because that's their business. So they actually make our internal reporting processes a lot easier as well. So we updated the vulnerability page on our website. We embedded an iframe with the submission form that goes straight to HackerOne. And we have that in preference over the email address. We've expanded the out of scope list because we realized a lot of people are reporting to us that we are running a public FTP server because normally that is a sign of a vulnerability, a sign of a weakness that you're not publicly sharing files like that. Um, so we put that as out of scope because it's working as intended. We also out of scoped rate limiting issues on non-authenticated endpoints because this is largely a, a denial of service type of attack um, and missing security flags on cookies that don't relate to authentication. This is because some security researchers, especially juniors or people that are learning penetration testing, they run a scanning tool to look for things, but they don't know how to interpret the results. So they took the results, sent us an email and hoped for the best. So since the launch, the thank you and hall of fame list has grown. We have a long list now. And overall, APNIC is more secure because of this vulnerability program. We've had some spikes over time, but largely things have been on a downward trend as more and more vulnerabilities are being patched and there's less vulnerabilities to be found. Cool. So that's the end of the presentation on our vulnerability reporting program and what we've gone through as those learnings. Does anyone have any questions relating to the vulnerability bug program at all? Excellent. Nice and easy. So the next module that I'm going to go through, got about half an hour remaining here. This one is looking at vulnerability assessment and penetration testing. Because as we saw from the last one, the last module, people externally will be looking at your network. They will be scanning your network, looking for weaknesses and vulnerabilities, sometimes to do the right thing and report them to you, sometimes to do the wrong thing and try and exploit them to break in and compromise your network. If you can do the scanning and testing against your own network, you can find the vulnerabilities and fix them before the malicious attackers do. Now, if you want to play along either in person while we're doing this live over the next half hour or to do this later in your own time, you'll need to log into the APNIC Academy. And if you haven't created an account already, you'll have to go through that process. This is very easy to go through and do. You'd want to do this on a laptop computer or desktop at home um, on mobile devices and tablets it won't work as easily because it's running a virtual machine in a browser and you need a full mouse and everything in order to interact with it that little bit easier. So we're talking about creating an account at academy.apnic.net. And also further down here, let me just bring that up. Laser pointer. So that's the general website for the APNIC Academy to create an account. Down here is the actual virtual labs. Now, if you just go to slash virtual labs, you'll go to the page with a long list of different virtual labs. You then scroll down, it's near the bottom and it's called vulnerability scanning and penetration testing. But if you put in this lab ID, that's a, a capital I for ID, uh, 107137, that will take you straight to the correct lab. So you can leave off the lab ID and just look for it manually, 
or put it in with the lab ID to jump to it directly. But you do need to be logged in to launch the lab. The lab is a full virtual machine. I believe they're using VMware on the back end. Um, these are not limited systems. These are full operating systems with full use to do whatever you want on them. The only limitation here is the network and the systems in the virtual machines do not have public internet access. And that's because we don't want to be providing people with penetration testing attack tools while accidentally, accidentally, um, people then using them to attack systems on the public internet coming from our systems. So for security learning, it's in a sandbox. But in that sandbox are two servers with vulnerabilities and one workstation with the security tools. So you can actually simulate and run, well not simulate, you can run legitimate scanning and attacks against a Linux server and a Windows server, um, as well as learning how to use the tools yourself. So notes about the lab environment. Uh, when you start the lab, there will be instructions on the right-hand side. Um, in order to get the username and passwords, you need to click on resources. So by default, it starts on instructions and you click on resources. The instructions um, are only the individual commands that need to be run. The PowerPoint slides that I have here are the companion to this lab. Um, so if you want to go through and continue after today, um, I'll share the slides out or you can email me and you can get the full set of slides and follow through in the slides and the, uh, the virtual machine instructions. We're using Kali Linux as the virtual machine with the security tools. It's just a nice, easy distribution with the tools pre-installed. Um, you have no need to log into the servers which is the um, Linux server and the Windows server, we're using them just as servers that we're doing testing against. And if you've never used this type of virtual machine system before or the lab environment, if you ever see green text, like you see here on the right, if you click on the green text, it automatically types it into the virtual machine for you. Wherever has focus, whatever is the active window, just click on it and it types it in. So if there's a big long command line and you don't want to type it all in, you don't have to copy and paste and do weird things. Just click it and it types it in for you, but only to the active window. Make sure you've got it active. Um, the lab has a timer. Um, we do pay per hour for these virtual machines so they don't live you know, forever. Uh, they do have a timer. When the timer gets low, it'll pop up a message. You can click a button to extend the time if you're still actively working. If at any point in time the timer runs out, the session will be paused or suspended. You can come back, launch it, and run it again. These labs last for about a week. And then after that week, you can run it again, but you'll get a fresh instance of the lab. This is what the interface looks like. Uh, when you launch the Kali Linux, which is the desktop that we use most commonly, if you see on the left-hand side, if it's not going full screen, um, if you just resize the window, the outer window, just a little bit, it'll then detect it and expand it out, make it, makes it a lot easier for uh, use. Oh, okay. So I go through a bit of theory at the beginning here. Um, and then we get into a bit of um, some hands-on exercises that we can go through. Let me... I'll launch it up here so I can always uh, do demos as well. I'm on the internet. Yes. So this is what the lab will look like here. Up at the top is the one that we want. 
and you just click on launch lab. This will um, launch and bring up a pop-up window. And because these are actual virtual machines in VMware, it does take a little bit of time for them to uh, resume and, and pop up and run. So as it says, about a minute and a half. So going through the theory of vulnerability assessments and penetration testing. So understanding the difference between them, we're going to look at vulnerability assessment or VA first. So a vulnerability assessment is a methodical review of all vulnerabilities within a scope of a system, systems, or network. So you can set the scope wherever you want or as wide and inclusive of everything. The goal or the output here of a vulnerability assessment is a prioritized list of vulnerabilities that will help guide the system administrators, the network administrators, the security administrators, the database administrators to do mitigation and remediation. You usually perform a vulnerability assessment when you know you have problems, but you don't know exactly where they are or how serious they are. Vulnerability assessments can be done with credentials. These are usually what's called host-based, sometimes where you provide a username and password for the scanning system to log into a machine, to log into a network device and do a scan internally. Sometimes they're agent-based, not as mo so much anymore, but you install a piece of software and it can do scanning inside the uh, host operating system. You can also do non-credentialed scanning. This is scanning across the internet where you're only looking at what is publicly accessible or externally accessible um, via network connections. Vulnerability assessments can be seen as part of an audit of making sure that you don't have any critical vulnerabilities or you don't have any high severity vulnerabilities. Now in comparison to a penetration test, a penetration test or pen test is a simulated attack. And it's looking to compromise a system within the same sort of scope environment that you're doing here. The goal of a pen test is usually to capture what's considered to be the crown jewels. So the crown jewels is the most important, the most valuable thing within an organization. When doing competitions, they're capture the flag competitions, the crown jewels is usually considered a flag and there may be many of them that need to be captured. This is usually done to test more mature security defenses. If you think you've fixed all the critical and high severity problems, you may get a penetration test to come in and see if they can find something that your vulnerability scans didn't find or maybe not a vulnerability, but a misconfiguration that allows them to go through or maybe even find something brand new. So when you see people hacking in movies, this is penetration testing. Vulnerability assessment is not very exciting and probably isn't seen in many movies at all. Now for both of these, I talk about a scope. So defining a scope is define the breadth and depth of an assessment. How wide are they going across? Are they only looking at a few systems or are they looking at your entire network? Or like I said, when I was doing the vulnerability program for APNIC, star.apnic.net. If it has our domain name on it, I don't care where it is in the world, I wanna know about that. For the scope, you also want to look at how far will the testing go? Do they just do some scanning that doesn't go too intrusive? Or do they do full on exploitation where they actually break into a system and exploit the vulnerabilities fully? Also, what is the goal of the team doing the testing? Is there a certain flag? Should they get access to a database? get access to files, get access to an email box. And also there's, there's two main 
ways of looking at the way a test can be done, black box testing or white box testing. Black box testing is a terminology used in a lot of different ways of testing, not just in security. But this is where testing is done without any prior or inside knowledge. This is usually when you hire an external team and you give them very little other than our company is APNIC, try and break into us. Now, there are some benefits and some downsides to this sort of a test. Benefit is the simulation that they're running like a real external attacker, but it's a lot more work for them, especially if they're going to find your domain names anyways, they're going to find your IP addresses anyways. That may be something that's a bit more useful that you could give them to give them a jump start, which leads towards white box testing. This is where they have knowledge of the environment, sometimes run as an internal team. The testing can be done from internal or external, but doing with a bit more knowledge of what the environment looks like. Now, when we talk about simulated attacking, penetration, and hacking, we have to think about the legal issues here. So it's very important that you stay on the right side of the law. Almost every country and economy has some sort of legal definition around illegal activity, action, and unauthorized access. There's entire codes of ethics around this for professional pen testers and certifications for pen testers. You want to make sure that you always stay legal, you always have permission, and preferably permission that's written down and not just verbal permission. When it comes to the different types of uh, black hats and hackers from their perspective and how they operate, when we refer to a black hat hacker, it's usually the ones that don't have permission and are performing illegal activity in one way or another. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the white hat hackers, the security professionals that operate legally and with permission, usually employed or contracted to a company. And the gray hats, these are the ones that are sitting on the fence between black and white, and there's no strict definition of what a gray hat hacker is. So if anyone ever refers to a gray hat hacker, you may want to ask them what their definition is. Sometimes this is a white hat hacker in the daytime as their paid job, but they use their knowledge and experience at night to do illegal activities under their own personal activity. This could also refer to a black hat hacker who's reformed and is now doing consulting and business work rather than doing the illegal work still. Or maybe it's somebody who is doing illegal activity, but for the benefit of trying to make things more secure and not leaking personal data. Many different definitions for gray hat. Now, one of the important things when it comes to penetration testing is the post pen test report. This is the way that the information found is communicated to the organization. This is showing dramatic proof, usually in the way of like a copy of an email or something that proves that they were able to break into a system. It should also be documenting all of the actions taken in a way that can be reproduced so that if you fix a vulnerability, you can run the same commands and see if the attack would still succeed or not. A good report should also detail the amount of effort taken. If they could just use one publicly accessible tool and a couple of minutes to run it and execute it and gain access, that's a very low effort attack that gave them results. Comparatively, if they have to write a whole program and research the vulnerability, it may take a lot more time and most attackers may not do that. And most importantly, a post pen test report is going to provide actionable intelligence. And I, I really love these two words 
because it shows the usefulness of it. Actionable intelligence, rather than a big report that you can't do anything with. Yes. Oh, come, come, come to the microphone. That way, people virtually can hear as well. For some, for some vulnerability, yes. which, uh, which is zero day vulnerability, what can we eliminate? Yeah, so talking about zero day vulnerabilities, if a vulnerability pen tester um, who's actually you you pay them for service if they find a zero day that allows you to go to the vendor um, there is sometimes in the contract with a, a, a security researcher the contract may say that if they find a brand new vulnerability they own it and they can contact the vendor for a fix or sometimes the contract will say the person paying the researcher owns the vulnerability and they have the option of contacting the, uh, the vendor directly. Um, but this allows you, depending upon the type of vulnerability, you can put some layers in front to stop it from being exploited. But in reality, you have to then contact the vendor, wait for them to create a patch or a fix or a new version, and then get that applied. Um, no two vulnerabilities are going to be the same. Some may have a workaround where you just change a configuration and that helps, but some there's nothing you can do other than put a new version in. And sometimes you have to wait 60 or 90 days even for that new version to be created. Um, but if they really have found something that is zero day, if it's somebody that you're paying to do work, then they shouldn't be telling anyone publicly. So in theory, nobody else is going to be attacking you with that zero day because it was found under private circumstances. So, but yeah, we, we've actually had that once or twice at APNIC where someone has found a vulnerability on our systems that was a vulnerability in software that we had to go to the vendor for. So it's, uh, it, it's really interesting, but yeah, those things happen. Sometimes they're small. Sometimes the zero day vulnerability would just allow denial of service, you know, relatively small thing, but it's still classed as zero day because the vendor, the, the software company doesn't know about it yet. And that's the definition for zero day. Not every zero day is scary. So, <laughs> but yes, thank you for the question. Do you want a chocolate? Uh, no, no, my name's off. I should stand up, sorry. <laughs> so when we talk about vulnerability assessments and pen testing, if you only do them once, you're not going to get the most benefit. If you do them once, you get a list of vulnerabilities, and then you start working on them and fixing them. But if you never check on them again, you don't really know if your fix was complete and if there's no other vulnerabilities. So both vulnerability assessments and penetration tests are best performed on a regular basis. And that could be once a year or maybe even once a month. Some vulnerability scans can actually run continuously. So as soon as it's done scanning your entire network, it starts again and scans it again. And again, and it's constantly looking for changes. The changes could be in a good way that you've fixed the vulnerability, but it could also be that a new vulnerability has been discovered, or maybe a new server has appeared on your network that has old vulnerabilities in it. And you want to know about those very quickly. So the frequency of testing will tell you how quickly you're going to be notified. If you only do a scan once a, once a year, it could be 11 months. It could be 363 days until you discover the vulnerability has been on your network. Now, regular testing may be part of compliance. If your company is PCI DSS certified or ISO 27001 
or maybe some government critical infrastructure requirements, you may have a requirement to do regular testing. So you need to make sure that you follow through with that. And down at the bottom, penetration tests are best repeated after the remediation work has been completed. There's no point in doing a repeated penetration test if you haven't fixed any vulnerabilities. Now to have a look at what an attack lifecycle looks like, th this is very simple, but it's still mostly accurate. So we'll go through and we'll look at these steps. Starting from the left-hand side, the initial reconnaissance or doing some scanning, finding out email addresses, finding out IP addresses and domain names, maybe checking to see what services are running and maybe what versions they're running as well, getting collecting information or reconnaissance here. Then when they find a way to break into a system, that's where then the initial compromise happens. The initial compromise may not give high levels of access. It might just give user or anonymous access, not root or administrator. From that initial compromise, the attacker will usually try and establish a foothold or a way of getting back into the system. So a very easy way to think about this, if the initial compromise is exploiting a vulnerability in a web server, they may then create a user account, open up a firewall, turn on SSH daemon, and allow them to SSH into the server. Then if the web server ever gets updated or patched, they still have access into the system via SSH, and they don't have to rely upon the vulnerability anymore. From there, once they have a foothold and they can regain access to the system easily, they will try and escalate privileges so that they can do more things. Root or administrator access gives you a lot more access to things on a system. For example, cached credentials that you could then crack those credentials and use them to access other systems with usernames and passwords, not even having to do vulnerabilities. It also allows you to hide your tracks better. With administrator or root access, you can clean up log files, you can put in root kits, you can put in malicious software that is basically invisible to the operating system. Now, once you've elevated privileges, you've basically what security people call owned a system or pwned the system. You basically have ownership rights. You have the same privileges as the legitimate owner of that system. Now from there, usually one system is not enough. That might be something in a DMZ or an edge service, maybe something that doesn't have access to confidential information or privileged data. So from there, they're going to use the system that they have escalated privileges on. They're going to download some tools or they're going to use tools that are already on the system called living off the land and they're going to do more reconnaissance, but they can do it from that inside of the network now. So they're going to do more scanning. They're going to look for more vulnerabilities. They're going to read your documentation. They're going to look at your network maps and they're going to then move laterally and they're going to move around inside of your network, repeating the process again and again, gaining more systems that they have access to, gaining more credentials, gaining access to more data, maintaining their presence on these other systems. So if that first system that has SSH credentials, if that gets closed off, they have other ways of getting back into the network. Maybe things that are calling out and making outbound connections that are a lot harder to detect and block. They maintain that presence, if they need to, they then escalate privileges and they hop around from machine to machine to machine until sometimes they actually have a better map and better control over your network than what you do. 
And then at some point, that cycle is going to stop and they're going to complete their mission. The mission could be any number of different things. Could be having fun and they're done having fun, so they just never come back again. It could be um, infecting your computers with ransomware and then charging money and extortion to gain access. It could be copying data. It could be um, hosting illegal files on your systems, a whole number of different things, or a combination of them. Now, just when we get into some of the tools and things, um, they're not super fancy tools, but they can be used for illegal purposes. And remember that if you are using hacking tools or security testing tools from Thailand to test a server in Australia, that could actually be two countries' laws that you are breaking at the same time. So you do need to be very careful about the permission of the network you are using and the network that you are testing against. For example, if your company is using AWS and you want to use a server on AWS to scan the outside of your corporate network, you need to check your terms and conditions of AWS to see if they allow you to run security testing tools and if you have to notify them about it. Different virtual hosting providers have different requirements. And then if you're testing your own network, you want to make sure that you have written permission from your company that you are going to be allowed to do this type of testing. So permission, permission, written permission, don't forget permission. In the lab environment, there's no internet access, um, but we are giving you permission to do the testing inside of that virtual machine, virtual network um, thing. So in the virtual machine, we're using Kali Linux. Uh, we're just using default username and password because it is a sandboxed environment and it's just easier for training and testing environments. So uh, username is root, password is tour, which is root backwards. Um, you can open a, a terminal window and the other address that you can do, that you should be getting is 101 and the other servers should be 102, 103. It's in the instructions there. Now, the rest of these slides, we only have a few minutes left, so I'm just going to sample into things here. Um, we start off and we go through step by step, basically going through the whole attack life cycle. And we walk you through it step by step. And, it, and it's pretty cool because at the end, you get the feeling, oh, I, I just hacked into a server and that was fun. Um, but we go through step by step. So the first few tools is all about reconnaissance. It's all about gathering information, scanning networks and looking for things. This is going to be the most beneficial to you. Because when you learn about doing reconnaissance, about doing scanning, these are using free open source tools. And you can go through, you can write scripts to actually run these tools on a regular basis. Um, it's in a few slides, but we may not get to it in time. Nmap can export the results into an XML formatted file, which of course is computer readable. Nmap comes with a tool called NDIF. NDIF looks for differences in the Nmap XML format. So you can do an Nmap scan of your network today, save it to a file. You can do an Nmap scan of your network tomorrow, save it to a file. Run Ndiff between today's file and tomorrow's file, or tomorrow it would be today's file and yesterday's file. And you would then see what has changed on your network from a network scanning perspective. If it's things that you expect to see, you ran up a new server on an IP address, you installed a new uh, network switch with a uh, management port on your network, if you expect those things, you'll get it, you'll see it, you go, yeah, that's fine. 
But if things appear on your network that you're not expecting, you can then get notified about that nice and quick. So you can run these tools like Nmap on a daily basis. And if nothing changes, you don't get an email. If something changes, you get an email only showing you the changes. One change, two lines, a plus and a minus, and you're done. Nmap is a really great tool. Um, even before I got into security, Nmap existed, um, which is a, a few years ago. Um, it started off really small and basic. It's grown. It now has additional uh, tools and plugins and extensions that you can do and scripts that you can run with it. You can do all sorts of vulnerability scanning just with this one tool. There is so much that you can do from Nmap. It is amazing. Um, <laughs> Nmap's when, when movies want to be realistic, they actually use Nmap because Nmap is for everybody, for, for white hats, for black hats, for everybody, Nmap is where you start. It gives you the reconnaissance of what you need. Um, so yeah, so you can actually see screenshots at the website from uh, how it's featured in the different movies. The, the authors of Nmap are very proud of movies using it. Now there's lots of different ways that you can use Nmap. Um, if you've never used it before, this is a nice progression of simple ways of doing different types of scanning. Um, the lowercase s means scan, the capital S means SIN scan, or the type of scan that we're doing here. Anything in green courier you would be typing in. Um, so here we're doing a SIN scan. What that means is we send a SIN packet to a port, we look for an ACK reply, but then we leave it at that. We don't finish the three-way handshake. This is very fast and typically doesn't show up in logs. Maybe a firewall would see it in the, if there was a firewall in the middle, but because you're not finishing a three-way handshake, the server doesn't log it really fast. But the only information you get is whether a port is open or not. You don't get banners, you don't get version numbers or anything like that. The next one up, you can do SV. So instead of a SIN scan, we're doing a version scan. Here, we're actually finishing the three-way handshake and we're listening for the banner message, whether it's a open SSH banner message or an Apache banner message in the HTTP headers or anything like that. Now here, we're adding on an extra option for dash O. This is for operating system detection. It looks at different things such as MTUs and uh, windows and packet sizes and initial flags and responses and things. And it tries to determine what is the TCP IP stack running on the system there. And it tries to detect at a very basic level, is this some sort of a network device? Is this a Windows machine or a Linux machine? Um, and sometimes Linux kernels change the way they respond to TCP IP on different versions. So sometimes it can actually detect the version of the Linux kernel running behind the system. Um, this obviously takes a little bit longer because it's doing full three-way handshakes and waiting for banner messages. Down below, we're doing an SU. The U here stands for UDP. So by default, it's just doing a TCP scan. If you wanna do a UDP scan, you can go for it here. Now, UDP scans are very slow because a UDP scan, it doesn't know if the reply is coming and it's just slow or if the port is closed. Um, so that's why we're using the dash P for listing what ports we're testing. So a lowercase P says we only want to test ports 50 to 170 um, so that it runs a little bit faster for you. But um, if you want to scan other UDP, go for it. Make it as big as you want. This is the one that I was telling you about. You can do dash O lowercase O and give it output options. By default, it just outputs to your console onto your screen, but you can output to an XML format here. It'll still appear on your screen, but XML formatted will go into a special file. Now that file is pretty much only useful for programmatic tools or the NDIF program that the next slide talks about. 
So from here, we um, in the virtual machine, I pre-created a few XML files. So from there, you can use NDIF and you can see what the differences are between different files. Now, this is a bit tricky because something has to change on the network in order for there to be differences. In this lab, in these virtual machines, things aren't really changing. So in the past, I turned on some services, I turned off some services, I made changes, I did another scan, and I created these XML formatted files here. So this is the point where I wanted to get to, um, because the, the other tools, they're interesting. It's different types of scanning, you know, scanning for SNMP and trying to brute force passwords and stuff like that. Um, but this Nmap one, if you're not doing a continuous vulnerability scan on your network already, Nmap is a small free tool that you can very easily script up. If, if you go on GitHub, you can find some short scripts where people have done that thing already of outputting to a file name using the date stamp and doing a diff every day and sending you an email. Um, or you can write it up yourself, you know, use whatever of your favorite scripting tool you've got. And this can basically give you a, a daily email or even an hourly report if anything changes on your network. Wouldn't you love to know in less than an hour if something has changed on your network? Of course, be careful which networks you're scanning. If you scan a workstation network, there's going to be lots of changes. You know, people turning on, connecting, disconnecting, DHCP, that whole sorts of thing. But for a network management network or a server network, things should be fairly static. There shouldn't be a lot of changes happening here. And if you're doing version scanning, Nmap will detect if a piece of software has actually been upgraded, if you're giving off those version numbers. So some really interesting stuff here. But these slides, um, we'll get these available to you. Um, email me if, uh, if they're not available uh, shortly. Um, I'll send copies to you. But um, you know, these slides go all the way through, all sorts of different things, all the way through to um, where you actually go through and exploit the Windows service and you exploit a Linux server and actually get in and you actually, you know, create a foothold, you know, you, you create a user, you give it SSH access and you add it to the sudoers file and everything. So um, really, really fun stuff. Um, if you ever want to play around with it, we use um, Metasploit as the, the tool to help with that exploitation stuff. So um, yeah, a lot of fun stuff. Um, but yeah, if you do have any trouble with any of these tools, uh, feel free to send me an email. Um, I'm, I'm happy to provide some assistance and advice. Um, these slides and the virtual machines, um, freely accessible. We run these as part of a larger uh, training workshop, multi-day workshop that I do sometimes. Um, but uh, yeah, and if you think of any improvements or if you find anything that needs to be uh, changed or improved in slides, I'm, I'm happy to know. I'm constantly trying to improve these trainings and these workshops as well. Well, that's it. I've gone a little bit over the five o'clock mark. Um, I am happy to answer any questions if anybody has um, any questions that they'd like to ask. I haven't seen anything pop into there. Um, but yeah, I'll get the slides. I'll pass it back to the, uh, to the Tynog group um, if they're going to post them publicly or just send me an email, um, jamie at apnic.net. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll be able to send you links to the slides and everything there. Excellent. Thank you very much for your attention and your time. Um, look forward to uh, coming back to Thailand again sometime soon and seeing everyone again, um, at a minimum, hopefully Thailand next year. But uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm gonna be hanging around if anyone wants to come up and ask me any other questions, but 